Um, welcome to uh, the third um, of our set of events sort of supporting the Westminster Business Library. Um, today, our event is the Monday Revolution, uh, which is the title of uh, David's um, book. Um, the event, as I said, is in support of Westminster Business Library, which is um, a service supporting uh, entrepreneurs, freelancers, and those beginning their pro professional journey uh, within the realms of business itself. Um, we're joined very kindly um, by David today, um, who is the author of his latest book, Monday Revolution, um, which is a very interesting title that was actually nominated um, at the Business Book Awards. Um, and it's providing people with you know, actionable, um, relative and um, engaging advice on how to improve or your working week. Um, David um, himself is um, a wide ranging uh, professional with many different experiences. He's been involved in, in supporting teams uh, with fundraising, um, with improving their, improving their performance levels, uh, strategy, and generating a really strong impact and outcome. Um, he's a venture capitalist. Um, he's involved in investment and private equity as well. So he covers uh, a really wide, diverse plethora of, um, of experiences. Um, he's been the main board of Capital Radio, um, PLC, and he's also been the CIA CEO um, of, that, of that company um, for eight uh, years. Um, he's, he provides many support to many different companies. Um, he's been involved in Carphone Warehouse, and other such activities too. So it's a really real pleasure to have David on board with us um, this evening. Um, I'm Rhys Samuels, I'm, I manage the business library and I'll be providing um, everyone with a Q&A at the very end. Um, so if anybody has any questions for David or questions for myself, questions for, for anything that they are interested in at all, um, leave it in the chat or in the Q&A section and then I'll be more than happy to take your answers uh, later on in the session. Um, so I don't want to delay anything any further. Um, David uh, will be giving his talk now on the title of Monday Revolution. Um, so without further ado, um, I will switch over to David. So David, thank you. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Rhys. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks very much for um, being interested and uh, tuning in on a, on a, on a Monday night. Um, so in, in return for that, uh, what I'm hoping to do is to give you some uh, takeaways, some action points, uh, some tips, some things that you can use uh, as a result of what we're going to talk about uh, over the next few minutes. Um, as Reese says, at the end, we're going to have uh, questions. Um, so please do uh, use the uh, question facility to ask me anything you like. I'm very happy to have general comments uh, if you want to talk about specific problems or issues or stuff that I've raised, then that's the time to do it. And Reese will be uh, hosting that little section at the end. Um, also, you can email me. Uh, Reese, I think, is going to be able to, to give you my details, but it's djm at the mondayrevolution.com and you can get hold of me via my website uh, and also on LinkedIn too. So I'm really happy to help uh, and answer any questions that you might have now or perhaps in the future. So just to sort of start off really, this is my, uh, my first book and uh, you can get it in, in the library and on Amazon and all the, usual, all the usual places. I thought what I should do just to begin with is to give you a little bit of background into how it came about. So a bit in my head for quite a few years, uh, as Rhys said, you know, I, I, I've worked in lots of different businesses and uh, some of them have been brilliant and worked out really well. Uh, some of them uh, haven't worked out very well at all. Um, I've got a lot of stories to tell really, a lot of experience. And, you know, I had for some years thought about writing these things down and I'd, I'd written the odd article and stuff for sort of, you know, online magazines and blogs and that type of thing. And uh, anyway, so that, that, that was sort of going on in my mind. And then at a book launch, actually, uh, over Waterstones in Piccadilly, it was a, a friend of mine was launching his book, which is all about sort of uh, PR and comms and communication, because that's the world that he lived in. And he introduced me to uh, a guy from uh, Cass Business School, part of London City University. It's a sort of top 10 uh, UK business school, got a great global reputation. And he introduced me to Professor Cliff. Oswick, 
and we had a good chat over a drink. And uh, he said to me, look, I, I really like to get to know you a little bit. Um, we, we're a business school, but we're academics and we're always looking for um, stories and examples of things which have gone well and things that haven't gone so well. And I said, well, you know what? I've got plenty of both of those. So uh, we went out for lunch. And again, he, he sort of stressed the fact that they're academics and they don't have uh, first hand experience. They get people into their business school to talk about case studies. And, you know, that was really the theme of our lunch. So we started talking about he asked me about my career and and what I've been up to. So I told him that uh, that I'd left school at 16. Uh, I did an engineering apprenticeship, which you know, took quite a long time. Apprenticeships don't seem to be that long these days, but it was five years when I did mine. And uh, I sort of stuck it out, but I've got to say, I didn't really enjoy it very much. And I, as I went through it, I didn't really have too much enthusiasm for continuing it um, when, I, when I'd sort of finished it. So, um, so I didn't, and, and I left, and I, I did two or three other things, which uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with, but uh, I ended up selling chocolates for Terry's. Uh, chocolate oranges and all the other stuff that they used to sell and that was the beginning really of my sales career and and some of my stories in the book and the stories that I started to tell him really revolve around the things I learned as a trainee salesman and those things are still with me now and that's a long long time ago I started doing that but those lessons actually carried me through right through to being chief executive of, um, of Capital Radio actually. So we talked about my time at, at Capital and all the things that we'd done there. Uh, we discussed my time at Carphone Warehouse when I was on the board there as a non-executive director and uh, they had lots of interesting things going on. I moved around at that time. We're going back now sort of about um, 15 years or so. Uh, when I was on the board of Carphone, uh, I left Capital Radio about 15 years ago. I joined the board of Carphone Warehouse and it was really at that time I went to work for a company called Ingenious Media and they had a venture capital fund. And if you're not familiar with those things, basically, uh, it's a lot of uh, a lot of people had um, put their money into this fund, which Ingenious Media had said, if you give us this fund to invest in early stage companies, startups and, and, and small businesses um, and some ideas, um, we will be able to turn that venture capital money into a good return over a period of time. So uh, I joined, I joined uh, Ingenious Media as a director and I was on the board there, but really my interest was in, in venture capital and helping them to allocate uh, what, in, what was a lot of money. They had 100 million pounds to allocate to early stage companies. And my role within that as an operator and former director of a business basically you know I knew about revenue and costs and finance and sales because that was my job and a lot of the people um, around me at Ingenious Media didn't have that experience they were very smart people they were lawyers and accountants and they had professional skills that I certainly didn't have but I've been an operator I'd run businesses and seen what happened you know things don't run in straight lines so uh, that was really my so the start of my interest into uh, venture capital and early stage companies. Um, and at the same time, uh, because I wasn't working full time at this particular point, I was being asked by various people if I would go along and help them run their businesses. So I ended up doing consultancy and mentoring and public speaking and even helping, as I still do today, some charities. I work with the chief executive of Teenage Cancer Trust, for example, obviously not on a paid for basis, but to act as a a business mentor. Um, so that was really how my, how my career developed. And it was in having this lunch with Professor Cliff Oswick, where he said to me, do you know what, David, you should write this stuff down. Um, you, should, you should think about writing a book. And he said, but, but you know, business books, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and often they're just about sort of one particular idea. Um, and, you know, they can be a bit over long. Um, and what I'd suggest to you, David, if you're up for this, is you should write a book, keep it short, keep it snappy, tell stories from your experience, but make it sure it's the sort of book that 
even if people are not that interested in business, they could pick it up and get something out of it and, and, and read it. So that was really under his mentorship, what I, what I decided to do. So we talked about what that should do, what we should theme it around. And we agreed on a single issue. Uh, and in my book, it's uh, literally my book, it's the thing I think is the biggest single issue for people today. And that is that everyone is really busy. And it's funny, you know, when, when you ask people how they are, just try this out. Quite often now, when you talk to people and you say, hi, how are you? And they used to say, yeah, I'm, I'm really well. Uh, and now they tend to say, yeah, I'm really busy. There's been a real shift in all of that. And uh, certainly my experience and the experience of Cliff, who talks to a lot of business people because they're there doing their MBAs and trying to learn about the theory and practice of business uh, at his classes or in his classes. Um, everyone says, you know, you've got to get cut through because my life is too busy. It's cluttered. It's messy. I can't see the wood for the trees. I don't seem to have enough time. I've got too many tasks, too much going on, too many priorities. Uh, I seem to set myself crazy deadlines. Other people set me crazy deadlines. I'm in a little bit of a mess and a little bit of a spin. And I meet, I meet a lot of people like that. And uh, to take the, 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 the words of a great TED talk by Ken Robinson, you know, he said that, you know, people in many respects have stopped enjoying, enjoy, I can't speak, have stopped enjoying their week. They've started to endure it. They sort of get to Sunday night and it really is a terrible test about how they feel because they're not looking forward to what's coming up and they just want to get through the week and, and get to the weekend. That's not a good place to be. And it doesn't have to be like that. So my sort of, um, uh, so that was really the sort of starting point. Let's think about how we might describe that to, to, to people. What's that like? And, and one of the metaphors that we, that we use, it's not in the book, but it's one that, that we like to share um, when we're talking and teaching people about this type of thing. We say it's a bit like a, it's a bit like I'm packing a new computer out of the box. So you get your new Samsung or Apple or IBM or whatever it happens to be, and you, you take it out of the box and it's a great new thing and it's, it's fast, it's responsive. And when you use it, things happen, right? It gets done like a new phone too. But over a period of time, we tend to add apps, we download stuff, we put programs on it, we stick in videos, we, we're into several cloud-based things, we've got spreadsheets coming out of our ears, there are photos, there are podcasts. But what tends to happen is we don't delete stuff, we just keep adding it. Uh, and you get to the point where the hard drive, and actually you, you can't, you can't even remember what's there. And we sort of say, enough is enough. And sometimes it actually quite helps if the thing breaks, right? Because you always get that option, don't you? On your phone or on your computer is, do you want to go back to factory settings? And that's really what my book, The Monday Revolution, is about. It's about going back to factory settings. It's what occasionally we need to do in business and in personal life. So this is about a reset. That's what my book's about. It's about a reset. It's how can you go back to basics? And, and the Monday revolution for me, and I know a lot of you are, have started your own businesses or you're going to start your own business. Okay, well, the Monday revolution for me is a startup. I said earlier that I've, I've done lots of different things and I was helping and mentoring people. And, and actually what I discovered was that when you, when you write a book and, and you post it on LinkedIn and, and you run some events around it and everything, that you can create a business out of this. And uh, just for the record, I'm not getting paid for tonight and I wouldn't expect to be, but people will pay me to, to talk and help them and everything. And having a book is a real opportunity because it gives something to people to grab, grab hold of. So I've, and you'll see this if you go on my website, I've started to try and build a business around my book. Okay, so, so my business is the Monday Revolution. And it's not just about a book, it's all the things that come out of it. So it's unsophisticated, it's back to basics. There are simple approaches to common tasks in my book that you can use for business and you can use for life. It's back to first principles. 
And each chapter in that book deals with everyday tasks. And at the end of each chapter, and people have said that this is really helpful, which I, I, I'm glad for the, for the feedback. At the end of each short chapter, there's, the, the, there are things that you can do. And if you add them all up, there's over a hundred things that you can do in the book that don't really cost you any money and you can start doing them from Monday. So I think that's a great thing. How can you seize back control? This is really what we're talking about. How can you get control back of your business life? How can you get control of your personal life and do the things that, that matter and not have that sort of feeling on a Sunday that you've lost control and you're not really enjoying it very much? Okay, I'm sure you're not all like that, but to a lesser or greater extent, you know, we have these feelings, don't we? When we look in our calendar and we think, right, what's coming up? Oh, yeah, I like that. Not looking forward to that. Need to get through that. That will be a great result and so on and so forth. All right. So, so let's do some of the things that matter. Now, what I want to do over the next few minutes is talk to you uh, about three things. Okay, so I'm going to give you, I can't obviously do the whole book. That would be crazy. So I'm just going to tell you three stories. I'm going to tell you about what was going on. I'm going to tell you what we did to fix it. And those are the little tips that you can use. So if this story, if any of these three stories resonate with you, then perhaps you'll be able to apply some of the things that we're going to talk about here. And these are just three examples of, and they're all real life. And these are three examples of, 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 of things that, uh, occur on a quite a regular basis and as I say I do, I do do a lot of work with different people and these are the sorts of things that crop up all the time so let me start with a guy uh, who I work with called Stephen I'm just going to have a, a little sip of water and then I'll get going <clears throat> okay so we'll talk about we'll talk about Stephen now I didn't know Stephen that well and uh, well, I didn't know him at all. Uh, I sat next to him um, at, a, at a lunch thing and uh, we ended up talking as you, as you do. It was, a, I think it was a charity lunch actually. And we just ended up having a chat and, uh, you know, we did the thing that everybody does is like, you know, what do you do, where do you live, all that sort of stuff. And anyway, one of the things that uh, I think is really helpful for everybody is, um, you know, instead of being on transmit too much, it's good to be curious, right? It's good to be on receive and, uh, uh, and so I, so I sort of said to Stephen well, well what are the challenges that are sort of going on you know uh, how, uh, how do you get stuff done how do you feel about about your your work are you enjoying it what are the biggest things you have to deal with and I mean basically what what happened was Stephen told me that really things were not really going very well at all he was um he you know he'd been recently promoted he got more responsibility uh, and his work life was in trouble. Okay, he didn't have a, a, a boss. He didn't, uh, well, he did have a boss, but he wasn't a mentor. He wasn't particularly helpful. He was one of those people that sort of said, well, it's a bit sort of sink or swim around here. You know, it's never particularly helpful, that, is it? You know, just chucking people in, you know. Great when it works out. Sounds a bit macho, but I wouldn't recommend it as a management strategy personally, okay? So he, he had really got nobody to turn to, and he was... He was in trouble and um, he was sinking, not swimming. And that wasn't a great place to be. He wasn't on top of his new job. He was chasing his tail. And not surprisingly, this had a significant effect on his, on his home life. And uh, he started to tell me about that too. He said, basically, you know, his, his home life was suffering because there weren't enough hours in the day. And this was causing him anxiety and stress. And it's becoming a a major problem for him. So we agreed that we would meet up again and I'd see if I could, I could help him. So that was exactly what we did. And there are a lot of things going on there. I'm not going to share them all with you because we don't have, have time. But let me tell you what the starting point was. And this will resonate perhaps with some of you. Right? His problem, and this is so simple, right? but his problem was he had too many meetings right? he said yes too many times his default to getting stuff done was was to fix a meeting and this is a really really common issue for people and it's become uh, more difficult since we've had this sort of uh, open uh, calendar opportunity 
So if you work in one of those worlds where people can see what's in your calendar, then that enables them to put things in the diary. And, you know, I see an awful lot of that going on at the moment. It's really bad policy. So if you're doing some of that, I suggest you, you have another look at it because having the ability to put meetings in people's diary just sort of, you know, it just takes time away from people and it's really not a good thing. And if you can shut that down in your system, that's a good place to be. But some companies have that as a policy so people can see what's going on and so they can get calendars in, okay? But you need to block some time off. But let me tell you what I did with Stephen, okay? Let's go back to Stephen, talk about how he started to approach his problem. I said to him, okay, and this is something that I do with executives in virtually every company I work with, everybody I work with says to me, do you know what, David, I just don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. I've got, I haven't got enough hours in the day. A lockdown in many respects has made this even more challenging. And there are people that I've worked with who spend all day on Teams or Zoom calls, put the children to bed, make tea, put children to bed, and then they start getting on with their job, you know, and they're still doing it at midnight. And I know this is happening. A, a, a lady that I worked with, um, this was going on because I could see the emails were sort of, you know, I'd gone to bed and the emails were coming in during my sleep time and I was picking them up in the morning, right? This is not a good place. This is not a good place to be. So the first thing that I do, and this is what I suggest that you might do as my first, as your first tip is going back to the reset point I made earlier, what you should do is have a look in your calendar right, and see how many meetings you've got each week and ask yourself some questions, okay? And the question really is, is that meeting really necessary? Do you really have to be involved in it? Did you really have to organize it? What is it for? If you've got a, a list of priorities that you need to get to, does the meeting schedule that you have in your diary work for you? And what I found is when I go through and people go, do you know what people say? They say, do you know what? I could have a call, I could have a phone call, not even a Zoom call, I could have a phone call instead of that meeting. And by the way, meetings seem to always default for an hour, they don't have to. I try and get my meetings to default to half an hour, okay? So the first thing I suggest you do is to go through your calendar and be really rigorous. What am I trying to achieve over the next few weeks? Does this meeting make the boat go faster? There's a great anecdote about that. And some of you will have heard it, but I actually had it told to me by a guy who, um, who, who said it, it happened to him on a boat. And that was quite simply, it was one of those um, boat um, races where they take amateur crews around the world and you have a skilled, uh, small professional crew, obviously to, to, to make sure you're going to do the right things. And the guy told me that when he was on this uh, round the world race, that very soon, uh, they found that their, that their daily meetings, the crew meetings, were becoming longer and longer, and they're talking more and more about stuff. And the, uh, the skipper said to them, after he'd obviously done this before, and he said to them, do you know what? We're in a race. The only thing that we talk about around this table are the things that make the boat go faster. Everything else is for some other time, okay? That's a really good lesson, right? So, so have a look at all of that. So fixing a meeting, shouldn't be a default. So before you fix a meeting, is there another way that you could deal with that? I'm all for face-to-face, -face. I'm all for interactions with people. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it should be on WhatsApp or text or, or, or on email. There's a place for all of those things, of course. But if you're gonna have a meeting, don't make it an hour, don't have a meeting as a default, and why do you need to go? Okay, that's the, that's the and could you send somebody else, okay? If you're involved in sales, and when I say sales, I mean it in the broadest sense, right? Because the second point that people make about meetings is they spend too much time on internal meetings. They say, oh, I've got to meet HR, I've got to go to an IT training thing and so on and so forth. And before you know it, the calendar that you have is cluttered up with internal stuff, right? And so I suggest to people that when they're going through their calendar, what they need to do is to mark what's an external meeting, a client facing meeting, or something that's gonna make the boat go faster compared with an internal meeting. Uh, meeting. And my uh, ratio for that, and you can make your own ratio, but my ratio for that is 80-20. That's only 20% of your meetings should be internally focused each week. The rest of them should be 
externally focused, right? I never meet anybody, anybody who says, I'm spending too much time with clients. I meet a lot of people who say I'm spending too much time in internal meetings, dealing with stuff. And you know what? An awful lot of people go, I don't even know why I'm going to this meeting. I don't know what it's trying to achieve. So the second thing is, if you're chairing a meeting or putting a meeting together, keep it tight. And my particular rule on this is have a three point agenda and don't fix a meeting for more than 30 minutes. And under no account, finish with any other business. You know why? Because people don't turn up at a meeting with any other business, but they think of stuff while you're talking. You get to what you think is the end of the meeting and you say, anyone got anything else to talk about? And they have. They always have. And before you know it, you've overrun. Everyone's late for the next meeting and so on and so forth. I see this happen all the time. So I'll tell you how I run it. I chair uh, a few boards. And the way that I start my meetings is to say, everyone's had the agenda. You've all had the notes from the last meeting. That's great. I'm going to assume you've read them all. And is there anything that isn't included on the agenda that you want to talk about? OK. And I promise you, at the beginning of a meeting, nobody has anything else that they want to add to the agenda. Right? So when I finish the last item, that is it. We leave the meeting. OK. So that's my suggestions to you on meetings, scheduling your calendar, getting rid of the clutter, getting rid of the stuff you don't need to go to, keeping it tight, keeping it short, prioritizing and making sure your ratio between external stuff, interesting things and internal is the right one for you. OK, my second story. Revolve, and by the way, uh, Stephen's a lot better now. I know you were thinking what happened to Stephen. He's a lot better now. OK, he's on. He's on top of it, which is great. And also got a better boss and that helped. And I couldn't help with that. You get the boss you deserve sometimes. OK, um, I hope I was one of those. My next uh, story involves a business that uh, I was involved in from the very start. So if you're a startup company, this one's particularly for you. And uh, it's about networking. That's the thrust of this. But I'm just going to tell you about the company a little bit just to tell you how it sort of got started okay so um going back 10 years uh, i was introduced to a guy um uh called uh, richard townsend and i didn't know him at all and he was uh building a business teaching marketing people the world um the world of digital okay so he was teaching them about the language of digital he was teaching them about the differences between um the the internet and online um helping them navigate their way through what was at that time was was much more a sort of emerging uh, marketplace and he was doing this in face-to-face -face training with a small group of people so he had some really nice clients he started out he was an expert on this and he was going out seeing companies um using his contacts to build a business anyway i got introduced to him and i you know how's it going and you know he told me what he did and everything and i said well is there anything you need and he said yeah i need help and this is a chapter in my book actually and i said well well what sort of help do you need richard and he said i don't know he said i, I need help with my help i know i need help but i don't know what sort of help it is and that's actually quite sounds a bit weird doesn't it but that's actually quite a common thing you know people know they need help but they're not quite sure where to start or or whatever so i i, I got going with um with Richard and uh, he, he said that uh, he really wanted to build a big business here like ambitious entrepreneurs do and we talked about that and we agreed that we'd never be able to scale the business doing classroom teaching so what we did and this took um, a year or so but what we did was we built uh, a business and he brought in other people I, I, I was you know I wasn't full-time in this company I became his chairman eventually but I wasn't full-time in it but we took his classroom um, curriculum, if you like, and we built it into interactive online lessons. And his ambition was to make the best interactive online uh, digital teaching in the world. And he spent a year uh, looking at what was available. And there's an awful lot of free stuff. And people said at the beginning, why would anyone pay for this if there's all this free stuff, right? But the thing is, the free stuff wasn't really very good. And his stuff was brilliant. So he made a pilot. And he asked me if I'd invest in his business, but I, I, I didn't want to invest in the business uh, until 
I knew it was viable. Uh, and so I said, you go out and make a sale um, uh, on the back of your pilot video and you know, I'll have a look. Anyway, he, he, he made a sale. And um, from that point on, we built the business uh, and, uh, and I invested in it and helped him along and eventually became his chairman. But the point of this story, um, and that's really just the background, but the point of the story, if we now accelerate and move forward a few years, we decided that actually the opportunity to build the business really resided in um, the USA. Okay, because we, we'd started to get some clients that were US based who, who we, we contacted. And um, we, we decided we needed a sort of, uh, we needed someone there. So uh, we, we took our revenue officer, our chief salesman, if you like, from the UK, who was very keen to go to America. He'd never been to New York before uh, to build a business. And he went to New York, and this is the point of the story. And uh, he, he, took a, he took an apartment in Harlem and then found out why the rents in Harlem are really very cheap. And he's quite a tough guy, but even he found the, the walk from, the, uh, from the, the subway to his house quite intimidating. So I'm um, not surprised that he moved to Brooklyn, a bit more expensive, but you know, he, uh, he felt a bit more relaxed. And uh, he, he built, he's built a business. Uh, now America is the biggest part of Circus Street's uh, revenue. So how did that happen? Well, it happened through networking, but he didn't know anybody. He'd never been to New York. How could he possibly build a business in New York when he got a product that, uh, that people didn't realize they needed from a company they'd never heard of? How did that work? Well, let me tell you, and this is, this is to say they're all true stories, and this is a fantastic networking story. So what Johnny did was he talked to the people that he already knew in the UK. So we got uh, lots of contacts. He got a very good network in the UK through to the people that he already knew. And he said to them, look, I'm here in New York. Uh, I, want to, I want to meet this company. Um, do you know somebody then? He used LinkedIn quite extensively. We'll come on to that. He used LinkedIn quite extensively. And of course, the people in the UK weren't the right people to make an order for, for the USA, but they introduced him to their USA contacts. And they weren't the right people either, but they introduced Johnny to the people who were the right people. And over a period of time, Johnny built up a network of uh, great contacts in the US by using his UK network and just asking him to help them out. He gave him a little compelling story and said, can you introduce me to the right person? And do you know what? People do do that. Right? They really do do that. People, people's instinct is basically they do want to help you if you ask them in the right way and explain why it could be good for them too, then they will do that. And so Johnny built a network of people in the US simply by starting from scratch from the people that he already knew in the UK. And there's a great, um, there's a great, uh, and he did a lot of that through, through um, using LinkedIn and getting in touch with people as well. And there's some great videos on LinkedIn. I'm gonna give Reese the, the link. It's a free 30 minute video and you can watch it while upgrading your LinkedIn um, profile. I really would recommend you to, to do this because it really does bring in business. It's great for connecting with people. I mean, if someone says yes to a connection on LinkedIn, they're saying you can speak to them. That is the whole point of it, okay? So I would suggest to you um, that you think about your network who do you know and who might they know, okay? And everybody says, oh yeah, no, this is started from scratch. It isn't really started from scratch because you already have people in your network who you know, who will know people that can help your business, right? All you have to do is talk to them and give them a little opportunity to put you in touch and that's what happens, right? Proven time and time again. And so my suggestion to you would be take some of that time that you've saved in my first story and apply it. Take 10 minutes every day just to connect with people, reach out, ask them how they are. Say, I've got something here that's interesting. It might help you. It's not all about what they can do for you. What have you got? Who could you introduce them to? But this works really well. Okay, so set a little bit of time. Don't be too ambitious, but set yourself some targets. It's about forming a habit. It's not making it an afterthought. Who are the new people you could meet this week? I promise you, it is the most powerful thing. Cold calling, emails, cold emails, forget it. Doesn't work. It really doesn't work very well. You have to do an awful lot of it. Uh, you can go and hire agencies to do that for you. 
mostly it ends in expensive failure. Okay, build a network and you will be successful. Okay, here's my last story here, and then we'll just hand over back to Reese. So my my last story um, is uh, about um, hiring people, and it's about evidence based decision making. This is something that I'm passionate about, okay? and I'll explain why. And this is just one example of evidence-based decision-making and how it can go wrong, how we can learn from it and what we can do differently. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you another story. This is about uh, a, a lady called Helen and she runs a very small but fast growing company. And she was looking to hire somebody to, to work with her, uh, a, a new little division, new idea that she got going, um, which was about selling smart, digital water meters. It doesn't really matter what the product was, but that was a world that she was sort of familiar with. And she got this new product area and she needed someone to uh, take this forward. And she was prepared, even though her business didn't really make any money, to invest in hiring that person. And she knew that great people, hiring great people is always a challenge, right? Always a challenge. And in fact, we might ask ourselves, why is it always a challenge? You know, it shouldn't be really, uh, again, not time today, but I, I can really help people think about why it's a challenge. So she um, had some applications. She advertised uh, on LinkedIn and other places, I think, and she uh, hired a guy called Max. Okay, so Max came through a sort of interview process and he got a great track record working for a much larger company. He built teams and he'd sold to key clients and Helen was really flattered. Not surprisingly, she was really flattered that there she was a small business that no one had really heard of. And this guy who came from a much bigger company wanted to come and work. And surely, why, I mean, why, why would you want to do that? Well, he wanted to do that. He said that he wanted to be part of something entrepreneurial, something smaller, something that was growing fast, something where he could make a real tangible contribution. And not surprisingly, Helen was completely flattered by this. This was the sort of person that she needed. He was expensive. He was more expensive than she anticipated originally, but she was prepared to put a hand in the pocket and spend more money uh, because this was the right person. Okay. So that all sounds really reasonable, doesn't it? And we've all been there. I've certainly been there. I've certainly know it when you see it, you know, difficult, difficult to find good people, as we say. And there was this person who just sort of showed up. All right. So what did we well, what, what do we, how did it go? Well, you know, it didn't work out as planned. It didn't work out as planned. And, and well, why would that be? Well, it didn't work out as planned because he didn't really have the right skills. Okay, we assumed that because he'd got a successful career, that he would know what to do. But actually, he came from a big company and he didn't have the skills to sell a product that no one had heard of to people that he didn't know. So back to my previous story, right? That's a real skill set that you need to have, right? And he didn't know how to get out on the street. He didn't know how to present the product. He didn't know how to use uh, a network because the company he worked for before had fed him the leads. And I've seen this a lot where smaller businesses are flattered by people coming to them from big, well-known blue chip companies on the basis that these guys are looking uh, for something which is more dynamic, more entrepreneurial. And he wasn't proactive because he didn't know how to be because he'd been fed sales leads. Um, he was bordering on complacent, I think, and he didn't really fit the culture. And that isn't surprising because when you've come from a big company culture and you're into a much more, a much more, uh, smaller dynamic type environment. I mean, basically, and you guys know this, if you're running small businesses, there's really nowhere to hide. You know, if you're not pulling your weight and the boss and you've only got four people, you're 25% of the workforce. So, you know, you're going to be pretty exposed if you don't get on with it, right? I mean, that's why people love working in small businesses, you know, because you get that hands-on thing. But for company, it's not the, it's not the same for everybody, but for, for lots of people with big companies, this just doesn't really work. Okay. Uh, and so he didn't fit the culture either. Okay, so that didn't happen. So Helen and I reflected on this and 
we wanted to work out why we got that wrong or what we could have done better. What was, what was missing? Okay. And I'll tell you what was missing. What was missing was evidence that he was right for the job. Because we've been seduced by him, really. We've been seduced by this big company guy. He was charming. He was smart. He was confident. And you know what happened? Our confirmation bias kicked in. All right. So as soon as this guy showed up from a famous company, we just wanted to hire him. We just thought this is the right guy. So everything he told us just supported what we wanted to hear. Right? This is called confirmation bias. And it happens all the time, particularly in hiring people. You know that old sort of corny old cliche that we make our mind up about people in the first 30 seconds? Well, it's true. We do. Uh, and then we spend the next 25 minutes confirming what we already believe. We know it when we see it. And the problem is that mostly we don't know it when we see it. So if you're going to be hiring people, you need to think about exactly what it is that you're looking for here. OK, and it's never easy. It's a bit of a minefield. But it, the more that you can put tests in place, you can put tasks in place. There's a couple of companies I work with who do this very successfully. If you're going to hire somebody that's going to be a creative writer, OK, that's probably an easy example, but make them do some creative writing. You know, you'd be surprised that companies don't actually ask their candidates to do the tasks that they want them to do. Some people are embarrassed about it. I can't possibly ask this important person to do these things. Well, you know, an important person will admire the structured approach that you're adopting and, and how you're trying to de-risk it. So you should have structured, a structured tests and tasks. You should have a structured interview approach. What are the questions that you really want to answer here? How can you dig deep? Um, and then you should take references. OK, and some people go, well, you can't redo references these days. No one wants to talk about it. Uh, other people go, well, you know, they just give you yes and no answers. Well, it's true, but I, it, but it's not always true. And sometimes people really do open up. So uh, I, I think that's really worth doing. And, and ask this person, when they are telling you all the great things they've done, ask them how they're going to provide you with the evidence, right? What are you going to do? That sounds great. It sounds great, Max. How can you support that? Where's the supporting evidence for these things? You know, success has many fathers, right? So uh, that's what happened with Helen. Um, so my uh, takeaways for you for that really are evidence-based decision-making, okay? What evidence have we got here? Let's stand back from this person that we've fallen in love with. Let's ask them to evidence what they're telling us. What, work, what do we really want them to do and how they can they prove before we spend a lot of money on them that they're going to do it. And the question that you need to ask here in evidence-based decision-making is look each other in the eyes, there's two of you, and go, hmm, how do we really know? How do we really know? Okay, that's my, that's my last story with, uh, with the takeaways. And I'm going to leave you now with uh, a final thought before we go into Q&A, which is you won't get any of this done if you don't have a positive mindset. And I say in my book, you know, revolutionaries have a positive mindset. They've got to believe in themselves. They've got to believe in the people around them. They've got to believe that they're going to win. And I have a list of things that I do to get myself in a positive mindset. And this might make you laugh, okay, but I'm going to share some personal, one or two little personal things here. I'm looking at a, a little list in front of me on my screen. I've got 14 things here. I'm not going to tell you all of them. But the things that I do do in the morning are in the bathroom, I play loud music. It drives my wife Alison nuts right but I get off to the day with loud music in the bathroom and I've got certain songs I like to play gets me going right gets me in the zone secondly I'm really into exercise and I'm 67 okay but I still do a lot of exercise I go running but the fact is you don't have to do loads of it running on the spot for a minute gets you going in the right way okay and I try not to worry about stuff okay so a lot of what you worry about is never going to happen. And also, finally, and I said, I've got 14 of these things, but I like to look back on the things that have gone well, and I'm not ashamed to congratulate myself because I do beat myself up when things go badly. And so you should congratulate yourself on how things are doing and try and be kind. That's a great place to be. Reese, that's me and the Monday Revolution. Back to you. 
Uh, thank you, um, David. That was um, some great insights that you, you provided there for us. So, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to have that. Um, some real sort of practical, pragmatic advice, which I think people can, people of different sectors and different backgrounds will be able to uh, relate from. So, yeah, really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so now we're in the Q&A session. So if anybody has any questions I'm going to pose um, to David, please feel free to pop it in the chat or in the Q&A um, below. Um, um, there's, a, there's actually a few questions that I think, um, David, you could possibly help us out with. So, um, um, well, one, one for myself, actually. I know that I spoke to someone earlier today and they were telling me about um, their business as part of their side job. So they, they have their main job as such. They have their main um, sort of nine to five job and then they do their business activities or they help to do their, their entrepreneurial work um, on the side of that. And obviously, I remember you said before about, you know, the day can be quite packed. You know, you only have a few hours in the day to do everything. Like, how do you, well, what, what would your advice be for those sort of people who kind of like have a, that main job and then they have something on the side of that? How, how would you um, give, give advice to those people who sort of try to juggle um, those two capacities together in a sense? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question, Reese. I mean, what, um, I mean, if you, if you go and look, uh, uh, I've got a sort of, uh, you can see behind me, I've got sort of stuff and, um, you know, I've got business books uh, all over the place, really. And, and most of them that are about entrepreneurs suggest that, um, you know, rather than sort of take the plunge immediately, if you've got an idea, if you can develop it alongside uh, a job you already have, you know, so you're not sort of giving up your income stream um, straight away so you can still pay the rent uh, and develop the job, then um, I think that the... The, the, really the advice that I, I, I would give that I've seen I've seen work is to make sure that you have a a sort of structured approach to that I mean I'm not I'm not advocating that you should um, do your sort of side hustle which might become your main event while being paid for somebody by somebody else I mean that's dishonest you know that's not a great that's not a great place to be I think uh, what you need to do is um, and, and I think it's easier now um, in many respects, uh, because of the virus, because you know, flexible working has become a thing that uh, is acceptable to most companies. Now, unless you're a Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan who seem to insist on people coming back to the office, you know, I know people that structure their day around their new idea uh, and their work idea. So, my my advice, really, you are going to be ended up working longer hours. There's no there's no question about that. Um, you are going to be doing more, but any entrepreneur that's, that's been successful will tell you, you do have to put the hard yards in, particularly at the beginning, before you sort of take the leap and do it full time. And so what you need to do, Reese, is you need to do it in a very structured way. If you try to do anything when you, when you feel you just might have enough time, it isn't going to work. It really isn't going to work. What you need to do is say, OK, I, I know that on Tuesdays I've always got between six and nine o'clock where I can shut the door, do what I need to do, and that's when I'm going to work on my new project. I mean, that's what I have to do. I cross time off in my diary when I've got new projects to do. I know if I wait until I've got enough time, I'll never have enough time. So I, I structure my week back to what I was saying in sort of story one, really. You need to carve out the time and be ruthless in sticking to it. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I guess I think by the idea of organizing and planning your week probably ahead is, is probably one of the nuts and bolts of, of efficiency in a sense, so that will be, I think that's probably quite useful. Um, a question that I can see that just popped up is about um, weekend working. Um, so the virtual world has kind of facilitated this idea that the people have more flexibility with their work schedules, but somebody has asked, um, how do you facilitate weekend working? into the, the working week, seeing as Monday is kind of seeing as a traditional start um, of the week. But if you work on a weekend, how does that sort of change that in a sense? Do, do, does it change it at all? Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I think that, you know, what I, was, what I was suggesting in some respects, you know, you could sort of say, well, you know, the, the sort of five day week, you know, where no one touches their work on Saturdays and Sundays, you know, for many of us, that hasn't happened. I mean, I work, I work Saturdays and Sundays because I don't really see, I don't have children to bring up at home anymore. I don't have the sort of social commitments during the day that I, that I used to. I don't have to take my kids to football or, you know, tennis or anything else these days. So I, I've got more time and I tend to work very flexibly. Um, 
I think I think that the the, the danger area here, uh, and some companies sort of go out of their way. I mean, this is uh, German companies. I understand. I've got a friend who works for a German company. You know, they shut their email system down at the weekends. You know, so you can't actually email anybody, and you read stuff um, quite a lot about you know, bosses that send email out over the weekends. And, you know, it, it unsurprisingly unnerves people because it's from the boss and they feel that they should reply to it. You know, I think in some instances, and I'm certainly guilty of this when I was running a business, you know, the bosses don't, 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 you know, don't expect to reply unless it's, you know, urgent and that would be apparent. Um, but actually it's much better if you don't, if you don't do those things. So getting the sort of balance right and all of that um, really comes back to, uh, again, that point about what do you really have to do at the weekend? And I, I mean, from from my point of view, I sort of think, well, you know, if you're working for a company that's prepared to be flexible and working on a Saturday afternoon isn't sort of wrecking your marriage or your relationships or whatever else is going on your, or, or stuff with your kids or you've got them, um, but you can you can swap a Saturday afternoon for a Monday afternoon. I think that's I think that's fine. But I do think that if you're one of those people that is likely to work 24 seven because it's just sort of there and you need to check it the whole time. You need to have a few rules in place to stop yourself doing that. Um, uh, again, it's, it's back to having a sort of structured approach. Um, there's no point in creating all this time uh, if you're just gonna continue to fill it with, with stuff that's gonna make you anxious because that doesn't really work. And you know, one of, the, one of the blogs I wrote the other day was about saving time because we never save time. You can't save time. Um, but what you really mean is you're going to do something else with the thing that you were doing. Yeah. So when we find a shortcut, we can't actually put that time on a self shelf and get it back. It's just going to be there. So before you save time, you need to really think what you're going to do with it. So a a, having a structured approach, I think really works. You know, I, there are people that, that I know who say, you know, I can't, I mean, I, I'm the same. I don't do meetings, face-to-face -face meetings on a Monday because that's the time I've allocated for doing things like this. So I just say to people, I'm not available on Mondays. And I'm not. And I don't go into town now you're allowed to. I don't go into town on Mondays. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, yeah, fine. Uh, you, uh, you'll find that once you have those little rules, then people will stop asking you because they realize you're not available. And I, what I used to say to people was, um, you know, I can't do anything before... 10 o'clock on a Wednesday, um, because I've got some personal, I have a personal thing that I have to attend to. Uh, and people don't ask about that, you know? They don't ask what that is. In fact, for me, it was going running three miles, but it sounded more sinister. <laughs> no, I think that's really true. You've got to really sort of um, build your boundaries and such, and then probably have those lines with people, you know, where you sort of say, okay, I will do this and they will do that. And there's sort of clear lines in between. Exactly. That's, right. so that's, that's exactly. very, very true. Um, so I'm just after quite an insightful question, kind of related to the first one that I might have posed to you. Um, so uh, what advice would you give uh, for those trying to stay motivated when trying to build a client um, for their startup um, during their full-time job? So, you know, what sort of, how do you sort of stay uh, motivated and stay confident in building your clients, even if you have a full-time job? And so how do you sort of keep up that emotional uh, confidence? Um, during yeah, those yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, well, I, I think that there's a few things there. Um, first, uh, I don't think you should try and do too much, you know, because um, often, um, let's just think about it. When startups start, the guys are usually going to have to do a bit of everything. So having some focus. Uh, in terms of what needs to get done when is very important. And I'm a big believer in small steps. Yeah. Anyone who says, well, I want to go out and create a unicorn company, I'm going to start on Monday, and I'm going to build a billion dollar company, you know, that's impossible. Right? Doesn't mean it won't happen. But you can't get your head around that. It's just too much, right? It's too much going on. So uh, a way of staying motivated is to congratulate yourself, as I said, by having some small steps, okay? Now those small steps might be, I'm gonna to put together uh, by Friday, um, five slides which say why someone should be interested in investing in my company, okay? Not 30 slides, uh, not an audio and video presentation, but some very basic things and you can build on everything, okay? This is, 
a proven way of getting things done. So staying motivated is to do with achievement. It's feeling that you've made progress. And if you do small steps, you will make progress. So, and, and the second thing is, you have to be physically in the right zone. And this is particularly important if you're doing this as a side hustle, right? Uh, that you're wanting to bring into the mainstream. So if you've had a very challenging day at work and you've scheduled three hours in the evening and you're completely wrecked, don't do it, okay? You've got to know yourself, right? I mean, I know myself uh, and you need to know yourself if you don't, right? So my productive time is any time from six o'clock in the morning until about one o'clock, right? And then in the afternoon, for like a couple of hours, that's when I'm my, my least productive. So that's when I'll read or do something which doesn't involve lots of energy because my body and mind need to recharge. When I was at Capital Radio, I used to sleep on the sofa. You know, those sort of power nap thing that you hear about? Well, I used to do that, right? Just for like 20 minutes and it really does work. It works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but it worked for me. So you've got to make sure that your energy levels are in the right place when you're doing the side thing. Don't try and do too much. Remember this saying, right? multitasking is the opportunity to screw more than one thing up at once. Awesome. Thank you for that, um, David. We've got a few minutes left, but there's uh, one more question that I think we can squeeze in. Okay. Um, so this person um, um, has got a, a good, uh, good business idea, but they're kind of very new to this world um, and they want to work with a mentor. So where can they get any help? Do you have any sort of like areas where you can put them in the right direction um, or anything you can possibly do to support them in any way? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we haven't really talked about mentoring. Uh, uh, Mentoring is really is really important. I think it's becoming, you know, it's becoming more and more apparent and obvious to lots of different people, whether it's, you know, helping uh, students. Um, I, I do quite a bit of stuff with schools, you know, and it's quite clear that you need a mentor that isn't, you know, somebody close to you, like your mum or your dad or, or whatever, right? You need somebody who can, you can stand back from. Um, so getting a mentor is really good. And there are various schemes around i'm i'm in a um in a in, in two mentoring groups okay uh one is called uh i'll just have a look at it on my emails hang on a minute one of it is called um all it's called let's just see i'll get it up here Whoa. it's called all it's called the all together company Okay, and that is a network of mentors, uh, uh, and they put so they put you in touch with people, and they you get so many sessions. So that's a good company. All right. The other one that I'm also a volunteer for is one called. Let me just find it. I want to make sure I get it right. So I've got a lot of this stuff. Um, can we put this in the chat, possibly, um, David? So that the yeah, well, you, well, yeah, you, yeah, you can do a sort of a follow up. There's, it's called um, uh, Be the Business, okay, and that is a government sponsored um, scheme, and I'm a member of I'm a member of that. Um, so, yeah, it's called. Let's just see. I've got it here. It's called Be the Business, and it is mentoring for growth. That is their strap line. And they get people like me to work with people who have got businesses who would like a mentor. Okay. okay awesome. So that's cool. That's, that's the altogether company and Be the Business. Okay. So I've just left some of those links in the chat um for you guys so that you can follow up from that as well um okay. i think you mentioned earlier that people can also get in touch with you as well david if they have any, any yeah, questions sure. or any advice sure. Or... sure 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 my my email is djm for mansfield at the monday revolution.com awesome awesome okay. yeah so I've got, I've got a website called the monday revolution uh and if you type that in, you'll find it and you can contact me via that as well. Or the best thing to do is contact me on LinkedIn. 
David yeah. Mansfield, LinkedIn, you'll see the Monday Revolution will come up. And if you contact me on LinkedIn, that's that's really my favorite thing. I'll tell you why, because, because if you've done a good job on your profile, I can see what you're doing and it gives me a head start to get to know you and vice versa. Awesome, yeah. Um, that's I think the business profile, and especially how you present yourself is very, very important to yeah. that as well. Um, I'll, send, I'll send all the attendees a link um, okay. of this recording and, and this session as well so everybody can have a chance to, you know, um, right. go through those links and those resources that Dave was kindly provided um, uh, for us this evening. Um, but yeah, we're, we're just about at the end of this, um, this great talk today. So David, um, yeah, many, many words of thanks and it's really happy to have you join us today. Do you have any sort of last few words to say to um, our guests here this evening? I just wish I, you know, I can't see anybody and I don't know what they do. Uh, so I hope I pitched it right. Um, as I say, get in touch if I didn't. And uh, I, you know, feedback's always, always really welcome and uh, good luck everybody. And, and thanks again for, um, you know, for, for tuning in on a Monday night. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered and I'm grateful. Thank you so much for uh, listening to what we've got to say. Yeah, I guess it's, guess it's only quite particular on a Monday evening, you know, like the Monday Revolution. So well, exactly. Find a little irony there, I suppose. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, we will have more events of this kind in the future. So stay tuned to our event by page where we be able to check out more of these items, more of this uh, great resources. Um, uh, David's book is actually on our um, catalog, our library catalog um, for Westminster Library. So. You can actually um, have a look at his book there, or you can purchase your own copy um, from um, from um, himself as well. So uh, yeah. stay tuned, and I'll give you guys all the links uh, to find those resources. But um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for turning up today. It's been a real pleasure to have you on board, and uh, David, I'll say thank you yourself right. for joining us. So. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Okay. Well, so, well thank you guys, and um, have a great rest of the week. So thank you for turning up, and um, good evening. Good night. <laughs> See ya. Bye.